truly a pleasure to be here, not least to say how impressed I am by the earlier speakers. It's a pleasure to be here because we're here in Beirut, one of my favorite cities in the world, and one that's dear to my heart, as you'll hear from the story. It's a pleasure to be here because this is the institution where my grandfather graduated, my uncles, and now, of course, where my beautiful niece and nephew go to, Leila and Sami Alemi. But it's also a pleasure to be here because I'm excited to share about with you my twin passions, surgery and technology. Unlike many of the young generation in this room, I am not a digital native. I'm now showing my age. But growing up, we didn't have the internet until my teens. And we had to learn about this world of technology and innovation. And we were able to go on that journey of discovery later in life. And it is that journey that I hope to share with you today. Because it is that journey that showed me the possibility of how innovation and technology can truly transform our world. It is that journey that taught me how we make the impossible possible, about opportunity, about breaking down barriers, and about reimagining the future of healthcare. And my journey really starts in Lebanon, in Beirut. I was actually born in San Diego, but at the age of nine or 10, my parents decided it was time to come back, time to connect. And so I decided to come back and really think about how does this country that's emerging from civil war can impact me as a young child growing up. Growing up in Lebanon, of course, as it emerged from the civil war, it wasn't hard to see the impact of the war as well. And for those of us growing up at that time, that impact was tangible. It affected us, it impacted us. It made us really think about community, about giving back, about legacy, about coming together to transcend adversity. And as a young teenager growing up in this environment, it made me truly think about myself and the impact I wanted to have on the world. And it is those early days that really defined and helped me define what my future would be. Today, a reconstructive plastic surgeon in breast and pelvic cancer reconstruction, but also leading a global health tech company, redefining the digitization of the operating room. But going back to this time, it was when I was about 13 or 14, a family friend, a reconstructive surgeon, invited me to join him in the operating room one day. I was 14, and he was reconstructing a young girl's leg who had suffered blast injury and trauma. She was unable to walk. And through his very clever incisions and, and work, he was able to reconstruct that. And subsequently, she was able to walk. I distinctly remember running home that day to my mother and telling her, I know what I want to do. I want to be a reconstructive surgeon. I want to restore form and function. I want to improve people's quality of life. And that was the home we grew up in, influenced by my mother and my parents, who are in the audience with us today, but also influenced by my grandmother, about the purpose, about making sure that everything you do, particularly when you've grown up in an environment where life is fragile, is about making sure that you're helping others. And so that was really what I committed my career to. I went on to train to be a reconstructive cancer surgeon, but I knew every day in my clinical practice that for every patient I was treating, there were many that I was not. And so for a period of 10 years, I committed my time to global surgery, traveling to different parts of the world to look at capacity and sustainability in surgical care. How can we as individuals influence and support many others around the world that need that access to care? And for those 10 years, it was incredible, working shoulder to shoulder with different communities, helping them really redefine their healthcare services and deliver care for those that would not have otherwise had it. But after 10 years, I started to reflect on the impact that I as an individual was having and that our teams were having. And unfortunately, in that time, the Lancet Commission was published. Five billion people in the world lacking access to safe surgery. That's two-thirds of the world's population. And for me, that was a punch in the gut. For 10 years, I'd been traveling six, eight weeks a year to try and help and influence that capacity. And yet, these are still the numbers. 
that we would need at least to double the global workforce to be able to address that gap. No human effort or heroic effort was going to help us address that number. What the report also showed was just the amount of surgeons and surgical teams we'd have to be able to create to address that gap, but also that an extra 143 million operations would be needed in order to, to bridge that. And I knew that even if we found the healthcare workers that were available to do this work, it would take us another 10 years to train them. And what was even worse was as we started to look into these reports and ask our colleagues in different sectors around this, we identified an even bigger challenge around surgical coaching, support, mentorship, how isolated it can sometimes feel in an operating room. When we think about operating rooms and hospitals, these can sometimes be the most expensive assets in a hospital, and yet they can often also be lonely. Everything is about a moment in time. It's analog. It's undigitized. It's only supported through physical co-presence. How are we going to address the five billion people gap by people and simply by doing more of the same? And so I started to really think about it, and I distinctly remember in 2013 sitting on a footstool in my operating room, looking around this room that's analog and disconnected, and thinking, how are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to make sure that people all around the world have access to safe surgery? Because me traveling to more countries wasn't going to solve that problem. And then I started to think about the world we were living in, this world that is becoming more digital, where everything we can do on our mobile device, connectivity, digitization, why couldn't we do the same in surgery? This world where augmented reality and Pokemon Go was coming to bear where we were all doing our shopping, our banking, and everything possible on our phone and devices. Couldn't we bring the same technology into the operating room? Couldn't we imagine a world where simply by using a phone, a tablet, or a computer, you could virtually scrub in to any operating room anywhere in the world to collaborate, to share best practices, to coach, to mentor, to guide, and to really break down the barriers of the operating room and create a global, borderless operating room. And that became my passion. I went on this journey of the intersection of technology and innovation and the operating room to build the digital platform to connect these things together. But as we started to evolve in this space, I started to think about how do we push this even further? What if not only we could also virtually scrub in and collaborate, but what if we could also aggregate all the knowledge in the operating room, create content from the operating room, and really democratize access to training, to education, to content creation, and to really build a global network of experts working together for the better care of patients. But pushing that even one step further, what if we could now use this data that we're aggregating? to truly thread the needle. What if you could now analyze these videos and audio from the operating room to truly codify and standardize the delivery of surgical care, to eliminate what exists today, variation. Variation in surgical care is a pressing problem where patients in one hospital can have a very different experience than those in another. And by creating the digital network, that is connecting and powering these operating rooms into intelligent, data-driven, collaborative environments, what if we could also leverage the new cutting-edge technology around data to truly understand what happens in an operating room and how we can improve that care for patients all around the world? Now, this is not a new concept, and I don't want to take credit for building the concept of data and digitization. You only need to look to the airline industry and aviation by creating the black boxes of the airline industry, they've been able to improve safety, reduce risk, and standardize the delivery of aviation. When we look to sports and athletics, they've introduced the game tape. Every athlete will have a recording of what they've done during their matches. Where the stakes are ever much higher in healthcare, why wouldn't we do the same? Why wouldn't we take the concept of coaching and mentorship in sports 
and translate that into healthcare as well. Why wouldn't we take the standardization and codification of aviation and drive that into the operating room as well? And so that's really what we ended up building, an infrastructure play. We were able to aggregate information and data from devices, from individuals, whether it's a robot, a laparoscopic stack, an open case, and truly redefine through leveraging AI and machine learning the intelligence of the operating room and build the operating system of the operating room, globally accessible, democratized at the point of care, and making sure that we can really connect the dots across surgical care. And today, this is being deployed in hundreds and hundreds of hospitals all around the world, enabling thousands of cases to happen on an annual basis, ensuring the delivery of safe and equitable surgical care. But when we think about surgery and technology and that intersection, when I describe this technology to you, it might seem abstract. But the reality is that there are human stories behind this. Human stories where this technology is enabling safe obstetric care. Human stories where this technology has enabled the delivery of cancer surgery, life-saving surgery, cardiac procedures, where we are connecting people all around the world on a daily basis to improve and scale surgery. But it always comes back to the human stories, the impact. At the end of the day, surgery affects all of us. A recent study showed that in our lifetime, we will have between six to nine procedures, no matter how minor or major they may be. And therefore, this is an important topic for all of us to be passionate about and to ensure that it scales. And for me, I'd love to share a personal story with you as well. This is a story of a patient who in her 50s, unfortunately, had suffered complications following a laparotomy, which is an incision down the tummy. She was in hospital in and out for years. She was in intensive care. She almost died. She had to be fed by tube for a year. And for a long period of time, her quality of life was significantly diminished. By the end of her surgeries, she was left with an abdominal hernia, which means that every time she would get up or sit down, the whole thing would bulge and would cause her pain, discomfort, and the need to be in and out of hospital time and time again with tubes through her nose and tubes in other places. This was not a good quality of life, and this patient was young. Eventually, a local surgeon here at the American University of Beirut offered to do her reconstruction but warned her that this was significantly complex and had a very high risk of complication and potentially death. But what she asked for was bringing in extra support. She reached out to us and said, given this technology can truly bring the power of all opinions needed into the operating room, could you please bring other opinions into the operating room as well? And so we obliged. And through this technology, we were able to allow other surgeons to virtually join the surgery and work together through this difficult case. And I'm pleased to say she went home a few days later and that summer was living her best life with her grandkids at the beach and since then hasn't looked back. And that patient is my mother. And so what's important to see here through the story is that we can truly leverage technology to improve people's lives, including our own family. That the power of innovation and technology can truly make a difference. Technology can play a role in augmenting what we're able to do, in transcending the status quo, in breaking down barriers of what's possible, and can help us in healthcare reimagine the future of healthcare that is accessible, democratized, equitable, with dignity, and with the ability to make sure that it is also human. And I think it's important to acknowledge that healthcare will always remain human. We don't, we don't see a world where machines and devices will fully replace clinicians, but it can definitely make a difference in making them scalable, accessible, and of course making sure that we can provide the best care the first time, every time. Thank you.